Okay. So at this show, in previous years, we've had multiple different ways to speak to doctors. We've talked with um, the head of brand strategy about YouTube videos of what doctors want to see. We had John Roberts from Very Well talk to the health trends about what doctors want to look at and how to market to them. And we've even had a panel of agency leaders talk about how to reach the doctors. In fact, we feel like we've covered off on sort of every aspect of how to market to doctors. But then it occurred to us that there was one group of people that we had not talked to. So that's the doctors themselves. So I want to correct that today. And I have to ask, is there a doctor in the house? Come on up. So while they're getting assembled, I'd like to welcome the doctors to the stage. We've got Dr. Richard Torbeck. We've We've got Dr. Judy Wenger, yep. Dr. Maria Castaldi, and Dr. Kelly Powers. So I invite you all to take a seat. And I also am not going to pretend to be able to speak your language or be able to pronounce a lot of the things that you do. So I thought just to start off, it would be helpful if everybody um, talked about who you are and what you do. Yep, so I'm Dr. Torbeck. Oh. I'm Dr. Richard Torbeck. Uh, I am a dermatologic surgeon and I work over at Mount Sinai Chelsea, particularly doing Mohs surgery and then also some cosmetics. I'm Maria Castaldi. I'm, it depends where I am, which determines what I do. So I have three jobs. Um, I'm a breast surgeon, um, I'm also, I'm a trained general trauma surgeon, and I also serve as a uh, surgeon for the um, New York Police Department. So depending on you know what role I'm playing is really what I talk about. And I'm Judy Wenger. I'm an OBGYN. Um, I'm in private practice. Uh, I have an office on the Upper East Side, and I do surgery and deliveries at Lenox Hill Hospital. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Kelly Powers. Uh, right now, I'm working in Brooklyn at a community hospital. Uh, I am a former plastic surgery fellow from Georgetown University. And I specialize in, uh, in diabetic limb salvage, uh, critical limb ischemia, do uh, amputations, um, hopefully a lot more wound healing. And I'm also the former uh, medical commentator on Fox News and Fox Business. So let's get started. The first thing that I'd like to ask you is let's talk about mobile devices. Um, do you carry a cell phone with you? Do you um, carry it with you when you're on your rounds? And if yes, what do you search for on your mobile devices? And I will take this question from anybody that would like to start. So yeah, I definitely have a phone on me at all times, um, not only just to, you know, if a patient needs to get a hold of me, but I use it more as like a peripheral brain so I can quickly, if I need to look something up, like. Um, appropriate use criteria or quickly be able to open up um, expert consult by inkling and look up a textbook, which instead of carrying around a big hefty test textbook, I just have it right there and I can quickly look. Or if I need to do a, a Google search and then pull up a video to show a patient you know, exactly what the most procedure is, it's just easy that I can pull it up and then show them on my phone, so. I also carry a phone mostly because I'm constantly being paged and, and uh, someone looking for me, but also in addition to that, I don't usually carry the phone into the exam room, but on my desk I have a laptop that's open, and we do a lot of prescribing online. So also it's there for drug interactions if you need to prescribe a drug or to show a patient exactly what, um, what he spoke about, showing them a procedure or you know a diagnosis. This is what we're talking about, and this is the surgery we're going to do, and this is what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. So I actually carry three phones. Um, <laughs> One, one, one is my phone that was given to me for the hospital that I do my breast work. My primary practice is in breast surgery. I'm a um, board certified breast surgeon for, for oncologic procedures. So lots of times I, I do have the phone with me to show patients a uh, little bit about maybe what the cosmetic results may look like. And oftentimes I do need to go over some of their 
chemotherapy drugs with them in terms of what they can expect for side effects and and drug interactions with other medicines they may take. So I, I do use that to kind of do quick searches and, and as well to show testimonials. We, we do have testimonials of patients that speak and I do have them on the phone with me, the video. So we do show those at times to have patients feel a little bit more comfortable with what procedures they may be expecting. And then I have um, a phone for health and hospitals, which is my phone that connects me to my general surgery and trauma world, which then leads to the third area. Um, I, I take care of injured officers for the New York Police Department, and my district is zoned to the Bronx. There are a lot of um, orthopedic and, uh, you know, muscle-related sprains, and I mean, whatever you may expect from an officer when they would be attempting to apprehend or you know do their job every day, the types of injuries that they incur. And that's something that I'm not so familiar with now because I, you know, my I've turned my attention to subspecializing in, in breast disease and, and oncologic care. So the these things that I learned 10, 20 years ago are not so much at the forefront of you know what, what I'm doing today. So I often do have to use the phone to look up what, you know, what the symptoms, what joint they're talking about, or if they have a hand injury. I, I really don't remember what the, you know, where the metacarpal is or where the phalangeal joint is, and I will have to often look that up to quickly be able to write and document exactly where the injury is. So that's what I use. And then I have my third phone that I only use for personal, where I wanted to merge <laughs> everything all into one, and I said no, because when I'm at home, I just want to be on my personal phone and not get, you know, bombarded with lots of work stuff. I'd like to think I'm equally distributed in weight in my white coat, that I have the wallet in one side and then the phone in the other. Uh, I often do take out my phone, absolutely, you know, in the, in the private room, but also sometimes even in front of the patients. What are we searching for? Just to b repeat basically everything that these fine doctors have said as well. We're looking up dosing, we're looking up drug interactions. You know, for the most part I see, I would say about 75% I see adults, but I do see children as well and they need, they need treatments and medications. A lot of times I'm not familiar with pediatric dosing, so I wanna do a little cheat in my room and find out and do the math in my room on the phone. Um, patient videos, I know we'll probably talk about that a little more later, but absolutely, so I do, a sur I do surgery, you know, mostly either diabetic surgery or sports medicine surgery, and it's nice to have to, to show patients, I mean, you guys are all patients in here as well, so to look at a video and to see the muscle or the bone that we're actually talking about, you can see sometimes 3D imaging in this video demonstration, it's really helpful. So the same way that you guys are Googling, and I'll try to use that word a lot since that's the conference that we're at, I'm sure your patients are too, and they probably come in with their Dr. Google hats on. So let's start with you, Dr. Powers. <laughs> Maybe you can talk to me about uh, patients that come into you that mm -hmm. uh, may have all the answers or more questions, and maybe right. you can talk a little bit about how you combat that. Sure, you know, this reminds me of a, I'll never forget a mug I saw in the, the, the kitchen, and I think they're showing it right now. So yeah, please don't confuse your, your five minute Google search with our medical degrees. Still, still, still holds true today. But I will say that, and I think the common, the common thought anyway for all of us is that there's a lot of pros and then there's a lot of cons. And they're probably obvious. You know, what is a pro? A pro is that the patient is educated now. People know what's going on, or at least on a baseline level, so that we're not reinventing the wheel when I'm trying to explain something to a patient. They actually have this baseline understanding, possibly of this procedure, possibly of the anatomy. Now the flip side of that is they often find themselves going down a rabbit hole where they come in paranoid and concerned and it seems like every search ends up leaving, lead, leading to cancer. I don't know, it seems like they all go there. They have a, a toenail infection and all of a sudden they're like, I think I have cancer, which by the way can happen. But, <laughs> but, but, but yes. And so educated, pa educated patients. And Dr. Yes. Torbeck will biopsy that. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all taking numbers after this because I'm gonna have to send you some people. But, but yeah, for those reasons, um, yeah, I, I think the self-diagnosing is wonderful in one hand, but at the same time, it really can be somewhat dangerous and, and just infl inflated paranoia that not, doesn't need to be. As an OBGYN, it is the bane of my existence <laughs> because every pregnant woman um, will read something online and either diagnose the worst thing that they have, their legs are swollen, they have toxemia, or they took, you know, four Tylenol in the last two weeks and the baby's gonna have autism. I mean, it is really a horrible thing because it, I find for most of the people, they frighten themselves unnecessarily and we try to reassure them that, you know, 
anything, there's not a lot of things that you can do that will hurt a pregnancy, but all women think they've done something terrible, and then they go online, and it just exacerbates that fear. So I spend a lot of time talking people down off the fence a little bit. Um, it does help me for, for patients who need to educate themselves about complicated issues, patients who've been diagnosed with complicated medical issues in pregnancy or pregnancy complications, because those are things that need to be educated about. But for the everyday things, it just frightens them a lot, and that's, it's very hard. Yeah, same. The one thing I would say that's a little bit tough is in dermatology, uh, it's very visual, so it's kind of nice that a patient can go and search for, you know, is this mole melanoma? And, and normally it comes back, see your dermatologist. So it's, there's, we're <laughs> seeing a lot of patients come in and say, you know, I have this spot, I've had it for X number of months, you know, what do you think? I think it is something that needs to come off, and then either you can talk to them and you know educate them on what are the things to look for in a melanoma versus a non-melanoma mole. But the other thing I find that's kind of difficult, uh, particularly in New York City, that we're very multicultural, diverse city, there's not a lot of skin of color um, kind of repositories or image databases, so it's a little bit difficult for someone who uh, might not be, you know, fit the mold of, you know, Caucasian, you know, certain particular age. So then I find that those patients get more anxiety, and so I think that's a little bit of a difficult situation. So we're really trying to work at trying to build, I, I know Google and some other um, individuals are trying to, you know, really get a good base of images and data, you know, provide a database for those patients. And what about video? Are you showing video through, I mean, that's gonna yeah. be a topic here yes. today, so I, I would like to. Yeah, I, I, a big video that I use quite a bit, I use YouTube a lot for my patients because, um, I don't know, um, I guess if I were to pull the audience, I don't know if many people would know what Mohs surgery is, and I don't want to speak for everybody, but um, it's kind of an intricate, complex procedure, so if they were to go and you know, Google it or search on YouTube, they're gonna find you know, something, a lot of blood, guts, and gore. So uh, the American College of Mohs Surgeons provides a video that's an animated video, so I usually sh tell them, you know, don't Google this or don't go home and YouTube this, but look up this video or mm -hmm. look up these sets of videos so they kind of are prepared for what's gonna happen because um, losing half your nose in a surgery is something that you wanna prepare that patient for. So I do find that YouTube and Google having those videos allows the patient to reduce anxiety, you know, mm -hmm. bar none. Yeah, so I, I also will use the ask patients specific, right, tailored, um, YouTube videos on exercises to do after breast surgery, what can and cannot be done, how to lift the arm, how to exercise the arm. And then um, with the officers, I will also show them areas in terms of rehab, which, which rehab exercises can be best done at home after you know a knee sprain or a, or a back sprain, so specifically for that. Great. Another topic that um, we are not 100% focusing on on this conference, but has come up multiple times before, and a lot of the folks in the audience are really interested in rare diseases. So I thought maybe we can take a minute to just talk about if you've encountered um, using the internet to either look up a rare disease or diagnose a rare disease because of something that you were searching for, if anybody wants to start. Or I can start right with you because you've got a phenomenal story. <laughs> so Dr. Powers, why so don't you tell us your so story? So I'm up here as a doctor, but I'm also a patient. I had a very, very scary situation happen to me. Uh, and what's shameful about it is that I'm a doctor, medical commentator, and somehow I, I missed all the signs. And so what I was diagnosed with is cardiac tamponade. Uh, what does that mean? It's fluid builds up around the heart and causes uh, the pressure, basically just causes everything in the body to, to, to shut down. So I, I have chronic pericarditis, and which is common, but here, I'll give my, my age away right away. So I was, <laughs> I was 38 when this happened to me, and no one really suspects when you go into an ED that someone who comes in at 38 years old and otherwise healthy has a heart condition that could lead to death. So I had shortness of breath and short and, and chest pain, and that's all. I know all of you guys up here are going, oh come on, that's a huge red flag. You know, you know, you got to check the heart. Well, they didn't. I was sent home from the ED. I uh, told it was acid reflux. It was just stress. I was a woman in a panic attack, and you know, one of those kind of dismissive uh, ER visits. 
four months later, I ended up on full-blown cardiac tamponade, uh, multi-organ failure, and I'm going to waste all our time up here if I list all the, all the organs that were affected. Uh, and I promised <laughs> I wouldn't spend too much time on this topic, so feel free to cut me off. But you know, the point is that those four months were very scary, and I didn't know what was going on. And you know, they told me it was acid reflux, and I feel like, oh, I don't know, I'm getting old now. Maybe that's what acid reflux feels like. I don't know, I have no comparison. Um, and so I used Google and internet searches to try to come up with something. Because hearing, you know, not having a diagnosis is almost half the battle. You know, when you finally get that diagnosis, you feel a little bit of relief. And not having one was very scary. And so I did. I searched. I, I, I kept saying, I feel like something's growing inside me. Like, I feel like something's happening. Um, and, and then the back pain started. And so that, with women sitting in the audience right now, it is one of the, the big warning signs for us with cardiac complications. Men may present differently. They can have back pain. I'm not a cardiologist for the record, by the way. But they have you know, the, the radiating pain down the arm, all the classic, the, the elephant sitting on my chest feeling. But women have this, just this back pain. And so through all these, these searches, I kind of came up with, I'm like, I don't know if this is really gastrointestinal, as this ER doctor said, uh, which led me to going to various doctors. And I will not uh, bore you with all the medical details, but I ended up finally you know, being at Columbia in the ICU, seeing a great cardiologist so and a cardiothoracic surgeon. And I did end up having cardiac surgery. And I'm also a Mayo Clinic patient. So that, and I will end on that. And so when you're, you have a rare condition, or at least at my age is a rare condition, uh, you, you want answers. And I, I found the best pericardial expert in the world through my internet searches, uh, which led me to Mayo Clinic. I flew out to Minnesota, finally got some answers. And I'm about you know, two years plus out. I feel like I'm doing a little bit better. It's my first cardio soul cycle class two weeks ago. I'm very excited. Uh, thank you for the clapping. It didn't go well. I sat in the back, but um, it's okay. I was there. Anyway, but so in so many ways, it, it helped me as a patient for sure. Yeah. So I think it's interesting that you, as a doctor, is also having to diagnose yourself in an area that's not your expertise, and you turn to Google to do so. Mm -hmm. I think what also the audience would like to hear is, as doctors, what else are you looking at? I mean, clearly, we're in 2020. You don't have these cumbersome medical journals anymore. But are there specific apps that you're using or any mm -hmm. um, websites specific of where you go to find your information that we, as marketers, should be advertising on? Uh, I, I know for me, Google Scholar is actually a huge and something I use quite a bit. Um, I had a patient that has a rare skin condition called extramammary Paget's disease, where it's a common one that is misdiagnosed as a fungal infection or rash. And uh, by the time they saw me, it was quite large. So I wanted to make sure that surgery was the optimal option for that patient. So I popped on a Google Scholar, did kind of a quick Boolean search, and, and saw that you know, the two options, there was some studies out of Korea that said that you know, Mosin might be a great option versus in the US, they were talking mo more so after a certain centimeter size that you should you know, maybe look more towards medical or, or surgical oncology. Um, I ended up not doing the surgery, and I just felt like that was just a, you know, a really a decision point that you know, normally you would sift through 100 books, or you'd have to go to the medical library and find the journal article and, and hope and pray that you find the right one. But it allows you to aggregate a lot of um, papers all into one and quickly search and look for the exact answer you have. Because it's not always like, should I do surgery or should I not do surgery? It's, should I do surgery in a patient at X age, this size? And there's all these little factors that kind of are decision points in and of themselves. For me, it's all the medication apps that when you're looking up drugs online, particularly with pregnant patients, there are certain drugs we like to not use. We like to not use sulfa, we like to not use Cipro, certain ones that are not contraindicated in pregnancy, but certainly not our preference. And then a patient will come in who has a sinus infection or has a bladder infection or whatever, and then they're allergic to penicillin. So what's the second line drug and what's the third line drug? And if you're treating them for, um, for strep throat, well, that's penicillin, but you can't take penicillin and you're pregnant, and then you can't take the other drug because it's contraindicated in pregnancy. What's the dose and how often and how much do you give because it's not the norm? And so I find, to me, the, when people are allergic to drugs or they're pregnant, I use those resources for dosing and choices more than anything else. And then we used to have to have that giant PDR book. Every mm -hmm. year they'd come mm -hmm. out, and you can't even read the, the print. It was so small, and it you know, weighs 200 pounds, and you throw it away every year because new things come along. Now everything is right up to the minute and the dosing, and it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. So, so I've 
I'll go the other way. Um, sometimes it's very time consuming because you don't get to the answer. Um, and, and as a, I mean, surgeons are, are very much not patient and need to get to the answer immediately, like five minutes ago. And it takes you to kind of like, especially, you know, when I have to change hats and I'm, okay, so what is the knee, what is the area in the knee that's bothering somebody? Is it the patella? Is it what the ligament is that I don't quite remember? Is it the cruciate ligament? Is it lateral medial? And I need to really find that area. I'm then taken to, you know, what ointment somebody can use to prevent, you know, a joint effusion, mm -hmm. right? So, and then you, you're kind of like trying to get out of that and you're getting into a different engine and you don't even realize that you've gotten out of Google and you're in Bing and you don't realize that you're trying to get back and then at an extra five or 10 minutes. So I, so I, what I've learned to do in order to kind of really target the searches and, and I don't know if my mind has trained me to do this, but I look for, specific logos that I know are actually associated with like WebMD or the, the big power engines that I know are gonna take me right to where I need to get the exact answer. Mm -hmm. Yes, the ointments might be important. Yes, the massage therapist that's on there that you know pay to get in there um, is also important or the acupuncture or the chiropractor, but I just need to know what the muscle is that connects the clavicle to the shoulder, right? Because I need to write it down and be able to say, this is where your point of injury is. It must be documented, especially for line of duty injuries, not down a rabbit hole that kind of takes you five segments removed when you're in a search engine. So I've- Yeah, that's had fair. So I, mean, I am gonna open it up to the audience, but I do wanna ask all of you. So again, you're speaking to a group of marketers in the pharma space and there is a lot of clutter out there and mm -hmm. us as an agency that represents this we always want to know where should they go how should they reach you what kinds of things do you look at that sort of can break through the clutter and is there any sort of secret sauce that you can share of things that you intuitively look at online or in journals however you want to be marketed to that we can give as piece of advice to this esteemed audience mm -hmm. So I think we all have our, each specialty has their own academy. So for, you know, the ACFAST is I think ours, Alphabet Soup, you know, those um, different journals that we check out, the big ones, Lancet, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, PRS, things like that are great ways to advertise to us to get to the doctor. Uh, apps that I've used that I really like are actually, you know, the ICD-10 codes. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. We were all ICD-9 trained for a very long time, and then all of a sudden they're like, we're going to switch it now that you memorized all those numbers. So now half the time I spend on these ICD-10 apps trying to find out the, the laterality of this diagnosis so I can get paid. Uh, and so that might be a good one for you guys to target doctors as well. Uh, Hippocrates, you had mentioned that, you know, mm -hmm. instead of our little manual or big manual that we would carry around. We all have that on our phone now. So Hippocrates is great to find out drug interactions and dosing, as we mentioned before. Uh, but yeah, all of us, we all have our academies. I don't even know your all your alphabet soups, but you know, American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons and whatever it may be for you guys, that's a great way. We all always frequent those websites. And we have the American College of OBGYN, and they have two real that are didactic journals, the Green Journal and the Gray Journal, that are marketed to us as didactics and we're you know, the public, where there's data and reviews and publications um, that are done. But they also get a lot of these throwaway journals, these OBGYN news. I call them throwaway because they come into your office and 50% of them are ads and 50% of them are, are, are little anecdotal or, you know, or little uh, interesting articles or practice management articles or things like that. And there's lots of ads in them. And, you know, six out of 10 patients said that using the this medication improved them, you know, 75% of the time. Well, I see that on the paper and I think, okay, well, I don't really believe that. Let me see where that came from. Let me see that data. Show me the article where you said, this is better. So I've used this for 10 years. This seems to work. If yours is better, show me how, show me why. And that is, makes me change what I do based upon real you know, clinical data and studies. I would just say um, it's not so much that I want to see more because I feel like when you watch television, at least for dermatologic drugs, I feel like every other commercial is either like, uh, and nothing against psoriasis, but it's a lot of psoriasis <laughs> drugs. Um, 
Or so, ointments. Or ointments, <laughs> yeah. So I think for me, it's more about uh, working smarter. So like a lot of smart advertising or targeting your audience. So like, let's say if I'm on Twitter and, you know, you know, Twitter probably knows who I have as my, who I'm following. And if I follow a lot of other dermatologists, you know, it's going to be targeted. That's going to be drugs that are, you know, targeted towards uh, skin cancer. Or, you know, if they, you know, Google has like analytics and sees that I'm searching for, you know, melanoma margins. And then, you know, I'm going to see some of those drugs or some of those advertisements that would be, you know, I feel like useful. But it's not so much that I'm just going to get every other commercial. It's just targeted for me. Great. So I think now would be a really good time to open it up to the audience. We've got these fun Google mics that are here. And so if anybody has a question, you can feel free. I do ask that if you state your name and the company that you're with before you talk, that would be helpful. So do you want to start? And these are microphones, too. So then you can be heard. And then you can throw it like a beach ball if you so, so desire. Speak here? Oh, yeah. OK. Speaking into the beach ball. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name's Lissa. I'm with Bard BD. So my question more revolves around patient awareness campaigns. I would imagine probably a lot of the people in the room have spent quite a bit of time on patient awareness and trying to um, help educate your patients. Uh, so I have kind of twofold question. One, how do you feel about them? Um, are we wasting our time and money building these things um, for your patients? And two, um, there's quite a bit of breast cancer awareness out there for patients. Nothing, I don't, or not nothing, but a lot or not enough on PAD and CLI. And I think that's probably an underserved awareness, um, or maybe there's not. So I come back to, uh, is it something that we should be spending our time on? Do you send your patients there to read up on patient awareness? I would say as a, I would say as an OBGYN, I do a lot of primary care uh, for my patients, particularly younger patients. I'm the only doctor they have. And women, partly because of the media and the Today Show and everybody else who comes on and say, you dye your hair, you're going to get breast cancer, I get 9,000 calls because everyone is terrified now. And the breast cancer awareness has been, they, I think they took their ticket from the AIDS awareness and they really ramped up the awareness in, in, the, in the population about breast cancer screening and treatment and early diagnosis mm -hmm. and self-exam. But more women die of heart disease than, than mm -hmm. breast cancer and it, it is a completely underserved education among patients. Now your blood pressure is 140 over 90. Well that's not really very good. You really should be 120 over 80. They've started a little of that targeting. You know, lower is better now, or you know, or your risk factors depending upon whether you have high cholesterol or you're obese or you have heart disease in your family. No one talks to women about that. Mm -hmm. For years and years and years, women were treated um, like men for heart disease, and only in the last 25 years um, has that become a big focus. That how women and heart disease are symptomatology, how they're treated. Um, but also awareness, and women have right. no awareness. Mm -hmm. so, so one of my organizations is that, that I work with, the American Society of Breast Surgeons, is called 360.org, it's, and it's specifically geared, it's run by the physicians, the breast surgeons, and it's for the patients. And we're, we're, there's, I'm the editor, and we ask for articles and relevant information, and I've just started to br branch out and ask um, the foundation who supports the the site to maybe have some advertising in there as well or very um, vetted sites that we know that are reputable that we could add on there in order to have patients educated mm -hmm. on the drug itself or not to have a physician just writing up about what the side effects of the drug are but actually the drug company that might be able to provide a patient-friendly um, little blurb on there that would be approved. So there, so I would say yes, and the short answer to your question. Um, and then my other interest is in marginalized, underserved communities, and I find it's very difficult to get any information in, in Spanish or to reach Latino, Hispanic, Hispanic community in that regard, and I rarely use it just because it's, there's not that much available. I mean, there are major organizations, Latina Share, that can provide, but it's a lot of paper. It, it's paper stuff that has to be brought to the office and then handed to the patients. So thank you for validating that we all have jobs, and that, yes, you need our advertising. So I'd like to open it up to another question. Neil? Just say your name and where you're from. 
Thanks. Hi, I'm Ricky and I work at Moon Rabbit. And uh, my question is, you guys all mentioned that you have some go-to videos or images that you'll pull up and show patients, whether that's animated or just showing a skin condition. How do you go about finding those? Do you have a, cri a set of criteria that you use to say this hits the mark for me? Or do you take it upon yourselves to create that stuff? Do you have trusted partners? That's a great question. And so I touched on before about how we all have these academies. One of the sites I go to is American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons. I know I'm going to find reliable information on there. And so I will either send patients to that site, or I would, they actually have handouts and printouts. So I often will print out the, tr the diagnosis, the treatment, and give it to the patient. Because the worst that a patient could do is Google it, find some invalid website somewhere that's giving them wrong information. So it is really important to, to, to direct them. I know we've all touched on that. Direct them to the right websites. Um, you had, Dr. Uh, Torbeck, you had mentioned about how there's certain videos that we want patients to see. There's videos out there that they want us to see, too. You know, what really happens in the surgery and what it actually looks like. You mentioned gut, gut, guts and gore and blood. We don't want patients seeing all that. So I will send them to specific sites for certain procedures. Something I'm doing now is called a lapoplasty or like minimally invasive surgeries. They have these really nice patient-friendly cartoon videos on those websites. So, you know, I don't get targeted by pharmaceutical companies as much, but more so medical device and hardware. So people who are targeting me, you know, Osteomed, Right Medical, Synthes, those are the ones I'll see. And so I will send them right to their videos. They'll often have a patient section where they could see these kind of cartoon images of what's happening in the surgery. I find it really helpful. And for me, a lot of what I do is invisible. I'm operating inside your abdomen, I'm operating inside your uterus, and patients can't even begin to visualize what that looks like, much less I explain, oh, I'm going to go in with a camera and find the polyp in your uterus and take it out. Um, there is a lot of blood and guts in what I do, unfortunately, but it is information, and patients, when you describe to them that you're gonna take out a cyst on their ovary through a hole this big and two little tiny prongs, they can't even begin to you know, understand that, and then they see it, and then post-operatively, after I've operated, I have copies of the pictures to show them, this is what we did, this is where the cyst was, this is what it looks like afterwards. So they have a base of reference, what's gonna happen to them, and then after surgery, oh, this is what we did, this is what we saw. I, I have, I worked with a plastic surgeon that I work with that does my reconstructions. He does take testimonials from the patients. I, I always thought it might be better if whatever implant he might be using, whatever company that was that could maybe create the testimonial themselves, so it's a little bit more polished. And I thought, not, not to take away from him, he likes to show it because he does very good work, otherwise I wouldn't use him. Um, but if he likes to create them and have our patients really speak, but they need to be a little bit more polished rather than just showing some homemade little thing on the phone. If the companies that whatever implants we're using at the time or whatever it is, the allograft, maybe could have some little section on there as well. We, would be, we would love to use that. Great. See somebody over here has another question. We, so just to give you timing, we've got about six minutes, so we probably have like two more questions. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, creepiness uh, and kind of that, that line. So I think, uh, Dr. Torbeck, you, you mentioned that notion of kind of retargeting, and then uh, Dr. Powers, you always touched on the ICD-10 aspect. So increasingly, there are ways of using data from, from EHRs to target at a much more granular level in terms of if you're treating for oncology, for example, you know, which line of therapy are you actually using? You know, where is there a, a, a deviation from guidelines, for example? And increasingly, there are ways to kind of correlate that with actual kind of patient behavior as well, almost down to you know, very kind of hyper-targeted geographically. These are the patients this specific physician is likely to be seeing. This is the actual prescribing behavior that they're exhibiting. Um, so I just wanted to, see, to get a sense from you guys around, I think there's obviously a general awareness around these kind of capabilities and how they're evolving in a, from a consumer standpoint. And some people feel that is crossing a line into creepiness and some people are, are okay with that. Um, but I wanted to get a sense from you guys in terms of when you're getting, actually getting to that kind of clinical data, like what's the awareness level of that and what's the comfort level with that? And can you state your name, please? Sorry, James uh, Atherton from uh, the Fisher Act Group. Great. Yeah, no, I mean, there's inherently some creepiness because then it's essentially like there's a third party in the room between the physician and the patient 
Um, I would say that um, like looking at ICD-10 codes and you know using that as kind of possibly knowing how a patient's being treated or being taken care of, there's still a large uh, ambiguity uh, within ICD-10 codes because um, you know, you might type in um, one in dermatology we use a lot is D48.5, which is neoplasm of uncertain behavior. Okay. And that code is almost ubiquitous in dermatology because it's essentially everything that's biopsied, they attach that code on. So the, <laughs> it, it depends on really um, how accurate you think the data is. So if you feel like the data is very accurate, yeah, then it is a little bit creepy that you feel like you can almost like you said to a granular level you could see how you know all the doctors at you know let's say Mount Sinai in Chelsea Center how they're taking care of melanoma versus you can then look at you know right down the street and see how NYP is taking their care of their patients so yes there is some creepiness but I also feel like um, th th we're advancing in technology and medicine and you know sometimes uh, the technology um, supersedes or is, you know growing faster than the medicine itself. So I think that th there will be um, some creepiness, but I also think that's going to inspire some growth. So um, I guess I'm uh, what they would call like an early adopter or someone that's you know more on board with that, whereas other people might find that to be you know totally violating the patient pr uh, physician privilege. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of that from the drug companies for prescriptions that I write. Uh, how they know, and I don't know how you guys do it, what I write, and I write a lot of prescriptions from hormone replacement therapy, birth control pills, antibiotics for bladder infections, a myriad of things. And they know what I write and how much I write and what I write of each you know, different pills. And so, but I use the birth control pills for six different things. You know, it's not just for birth control, it's for cramps and for cycle control and endometriosis suppression or people who are going to try and get pregnant but they need to wait a couple of cycles because they're going to have in vitro. So I use one drug for so many different issues so that you may see that I have, you know, you know, V24.2 is dysmenorrhea, but I'm using the pills for, you know, six other things. So it's it, it's a little creepy because they come in and they say, well, I see you've been writing a lot of this and this and this. You know, the, the they or the, the drug the drug reps come to me. <laughs> oh, I see you've been using a lot of this, and I'm like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so we've got time for one more question. Um, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. And by the way, the a, a couple of these folks will still be here at the coffee and at the um, cocktail party. So I want you to continue to think of the questions. Great. Thank you, Mike Kalfas, Eversada Engage. Uh, first of all, thank you for your time today. That's great hearing uh, your thoughts. My question is about point of care inside the doctor's offices, the outcome health, the health monitor networks, the TV and, and all those gadgets in the office. Do you find those helpful or hurtful? I, I, when I was in private practice, I would say that they weren't that helpful because they would just sit there and run for hours and hours and you know it, it would just be ignored or you know the MAs would literally turn them away just because you know, they got tired of hearing the same kind of thing looping. Um, but personally, I, I mean, I haven't seen many patients that are like, oh, that's amazing. Um, or I've heard other experiences from other docs and said, you know, we have this, but um, we're paying for this service, but we're not actually utilizing it. You know, we're not putting in forward facing, you know, right as they walk in the door, or you're not putting in waiting rooms. They're in all the doctor's office, like within the exam room themselves. So I, I hear mixed. And from, on that note, it, I would suspect that they wouldn't necessarily be targeted to you, but more to the consumer. So are yeah. they walking, are they sitting in the waiting room for a half hour and then digesting it and then coming to you and saying, this is what I just saw? Well, you would hope that. But a lot of times, uh, either the person who is, you know, is in charge of it, let's say an office manager or, or whoever, they aren't really paying attention to it. I feel like it's an easy one that they pass over. But I do feel like that would be a really smart thing to have, you know, let's say if they're there to see, you know, about a, an abnormal mole, just you could have like, these are the four or five signs to look for if you have an abnormal mole or like, have you thought about Otesla or, you know, or X drug, you know, and, but mixed. Go ahead, you were gonna say something? I, I agree, I think, I think if it's specific to what cause, Right, right, breast cancer screening, and if that initiative is brought forth in that particular point in time, it, it is very, very useful because just by rote over and over and constant um, feed-in, 
is really does at some point, I, I think, register. Um, so so I, I do think it, it at the right time and, and right place, it can be very, very powerful. Great. Mm -hmm. So that's all the time we've got now. So thank you guys very much for coming. <laughs> well, you're busy doctors. And I'd like to... Um...